I'm uh, very honored uh, by the invitation and I would have loved to be in St. Petersburg with you. Um, but um, it's also a lucky uh, coincidence that we can meet online, even though the pandemic still controls our lives in, in some respects. Um, what I will do here is to share with you a few considerations um, that I'm really excited to discuss with you as a group of scholars uh, that investigate a number of really fascinating empirical problems to make sense of cultural transfers uh, and interconnections uh, for Eastern European history more broadly, but for uh, the history of Russia and the Soviet Union more specifically. And I'm really glad to be in this group of experts uh, to discuss these considerations here. Um, I will um, begin my presentation by briefly recapping the trajectory of cultural transfer approaches, identifying what I think are its core assumptions which have made it attractive to historiographical fields, um, including transnational, transregional and global histories. I will then proceed by reflecting on how these set of assumptions have been perceived and discussed among historians who specialize in Eastern European histories and to discuss which challenges they have identified here. And finally, I will introduce some empirical insights from my own work to show how I think one could also go beyond the West in the study of cultural transfers by looking at black intellectuals and their imaginations of a socialist and Soviet modernity after empire. As is rightly stated in the program uh, of the conference, transfers um, and transfer studies um, have turned into an umbrella term uh, for a number of at times very different and conceptual and methodological practices and convictions. I therefore here need to clarify which research approach I refer to and from where I depart to discuss the potential and challenges of such analytical perspectives for Eastern European histories. I address here a, a cultural transfer approaches um, tradition which has emerged in the mid of the 1980s in the German French research context, and which has since then seen a number of methodological transformations, variations and expansions. The family of approaches and research, research themes, which has emerged since then, and I don't need to explain this in much detail in this group here, they have started to emerge um, uh, beginning from a shared double critique. Uh, on the one hand, a critique of diffusionist approaches going beyond um, considerations of influence or impact. Um, uh, by the, uh, the impact of one cultural community on the other and also criticizing and hierarchization between different cultural communities. And secondly, a critique of methodological nationalism and the essentializing of national cult uh, cultures seen in this um, methodological nationalist uh, conception as homogeneous cultural spaces. In contrast, the interest of cultural transfer studies lies in processes of appropriation, translation, re-semantization that are inspired not so much by the ambition of a sender to export a cultural good, but by actors identifying in their own cultural context problems and questions to which they seek to find answers and solutions in other cultural contexts. These actors and their practices as mediators are crucial to the study of cultural transfers in this respect. In the beginning, these cultural transfer studies um, were stemming from cultural history and literary studies where they also have a focus until today. And their empirical focus lie on temporalities from the mid 18th century to the mid 20th century with Western European uh, foci and later expansions into Scandinavian, but also Russian contexts. Particularly productive cultural transfer studies have unfolded in research fields and historiographies such as the histories of science and knowledge, of ideas and mentalities, of bibliology and literature studies, but also in studies of memory politics and memory culture, and more recently also in the field of histories of technology, of mobilities, of education, as well as uh, via the integration of cultural history perspectives on economics and politics. So while this field has started in a research geography that was shaped by nationalizing or nationalized conditions such as France, Germany or Italy, 
we have seen a pluralization of the spatial context in which cultural transfer processes are investigated, such as regional contexts or imperial and trans-imperial contexts, as well as they have expanded beyond Western Europe into Asia and Africa, and thereby also leading to fruitful interactions between colonial and imperial history of the Western European empires. We have also seen an expansion of the field uh, from a focus on bilateral transfer constellations between two cultural contexts, um, while researchers have become more and more interested in investigating multilateral connections, which can also be investigated in diachronic ways, um, so as a series of transfers appearing over time. Cultural transfer studies <clears throat> are characterized by a certain kind of transfer optimism. Uh, its focus on mediators, on the interest uh, of these mediators in foreign cultural transfers uh, and contexts um, have uh, been complemented by studies on perceptions of distrust and distaste on the refusion of foreign influence, which can engender transfer processes as well. Earlier contrasting in the field between comparative and transfer approaches that has characterized the debates of the 1990s and early 2000s very much, has given way now to a number of more nuanced perspectives on the relation between comparison and transfer, which suggests the possibility to combine both, either by investigating how comparing as a practice of historical actors um, can be part of transfer processes. People observe similarities and differences between their own and other cultural contexts and this is a practice that helps them to identify, manage, and legitimate certain transfer practices. Or using comparison as an analytical perspective of researchers to identify patterns in a multiplicity of transfer processes over time and in different geographical and spatial contexts. Cultural transfer approaches have emerged in parallel and uh, at times closely connected to historiographical fields that you're all familiar with, which share several assumptions and problem definitions, such as histoire croisée, entangled and shared histories, studies of cultural encounters that have all turned out to be very productive for the writing of global and transregional histories, which highlight their interest in cultural transfers and encounters between European and non-European cultures, and that which took place often under colonial conditions. The focus of cultural transfer studies on a period up until the uh, Second World War has given way now to a productivity of looking at the 20th century as a particularly productive period for cultural transfers as well. Processes such as Americanization or Sovietization have received attention in this regard, as well as East-South encounters. A more recent uh, productive conversation that has also emerged are scholarship in the wake of the so-called spatial turn with a focus on processes of re-spatialization with cultural transfer studies. Here, um, what we see is a rethinking of very different geographical and spatial contexts in which cultural transfers are investigated. So expanding from a focus of, uh, on Western Europe to um, expanding research geographies towards Eastern Europe as well as to non-European contexts, but also moving from a world characterized by empires and nationalizing states to the world of the Cold War, decolonization, international development and high modernism, as well as moving from nationalized or nationalizing contexts to transfer processes which connect between and unfold on different scales and in different spatial configurations such as in subnational, regional, urban contexts, in diaspora networks, along commodity chains, in portals of globalization, such as international conferences, universities, or refugee camps, which are all challenging the focus on the national and on congenial cultural contexts. Hence, cultural transfer perspectives invite not only for the problematizing of the nation as an ahistorical spatial format, but call for the breaking up of spatial configurations of different uh, kinds as well, including world regions. From there onwards, scholarship in the wake of the spatial term has begun to elaborate not only on the different spatial figurations as contexts for cultural transfers, but rather asks how cultural transfer practices are actually leading to the formation of new spaces and spatial orders. I will now turn to how these approaches have been discussed among historians specializing on Eastern European histories. 
As explained at the beginning, cultural transfer approaches have emerged in a research context which focused for a long time on interactions across Western Europe in the age of nationalizing states. In the historiography of Eastern Europe, a similar interest in entanglements and transfers has emerged in parallel without having been integrated from the outside under the same heating. Historians of Eastern Europe, however, have also looked critically at cultural transfer studies. Firstly, by noticing the lack of studies that investigate transfer between Eastern Europe on the one hand and Western European societies on the other hand, problematizing a dominance of transfer directions from West to East and implying in hierarchization between these different regions of Europe, an operation in which Eastern European societies would often be assigned the role of the backward partner. And finally, asking for the investigation of transfers between Eastern and Western Europe in its multidirectionality and in different chronologies, particularly also in the field of arts, architecture, as well as political movements. Historians of Eastern Europe have, on the other hand, emphasized that Eastern Europe as a region provides particularly fertile ground for the study of cultural transfer, and this for several reasons. Firstly, such historians emphasize that the region is characterized by a particular density of zones of cultural contact and entanglement in the context of neighboring multinational empires and societies, as well as a diversity of often mobile, political, religious, and linguistic border zones Secondly, the region, they say, is characterized by a high degree of cultural plurality, including religious and linguistic minorities, as well as the presence of diaspora groups across the region, including Armenian or Jewish uh, communities, as well as multiple waves of migration across the region and across empires. And thirdly, they emphasize the entanglements between different empires, as well as the intra-imperial complexities that provide a multitude for incentives for cultural encounters, which has also led to debates on how to integrate post-colonial approaches in the writing of the history of Eastern Europe. And finally, historians of Eastern Europe have emphasized the overlap between different nationalizing movements within empires and the formation of trans-imperial movements such as pan-Slavism, pan-Turkism or pan-Germanism of various kinds that produces a multitude of incentives for cultural transfers. These observations, it is argued, um, lead to a pronounced sensitivity among historians of Eastern Europe for these contact zones, as well as for the contingency and plurality of cultural transfers which are not necessarily characterized as peaceful and productive, but are often conflict-ridden, violent, or failing. Hence, historians of Eastern Europe are apparently more attentive to the complementarity of ever denser cultural transfers on the one hand, and the resistance to them, as well as the failure of these on the other. This sensitivity, at the same time, it is argued, shall however not be exaggerated into arguments about the specificity of the region as more or less prone to cultural transfers. For historians specializing in the history of Eastern Europe of the 20th century, the state of the art presents itself a little bit different. The arguments I presented above have been developed mostly by historians working on uh, the imperial periods up until the um, First and the Second World Wars of the region. For the 20th century, and in particular for its second half, a number of assumptions um, one is confronted with um, which seem to make the region less productive for the study of cultural transfer. Firstly, um, scholarship has argued for quite some time that we observe an apparent closing up of the region to trans-regional connections across the Iron Curtain. Secondly, um, there's a certain dominance of a specific geography of the Cold War's spatial order divided into the first, second and third worlds, resulting in new containerizations of these worlds. Thirdly, um, one often find arguments about the apparent immobility, immobilization of the societies in the region as an effect of restrictive mobility regimes. Fourthly, the, um, in the context of the Cold War, we also witnessed uh, studies that refer to the ideologization of these larger cultural spaces with ideology seemingly replacing wider cultural conceptualization. And finally, the emphasis on questions of diffusion of specific ideological models and the resistance to this diffusion along the logics of the Cold War has received a certain prominence, hence a diffusionist perspective, which is obsessed with questions of influence or export, um, 
has been uh, seen as uh, becoming more uh, widespread. And this is exactly a perspective to which cultural transfer approaches have critically responded from the outset. However, in the last uh, years, uh, one would say maybe one and a half decade, the state of the art has become dramatically enriched by a number of studies that reveal empirically the richness of um, uh, observable transfers and circulations both within and beyond the region. These have been first and foremost been productively studied for the century's first half, investigating, for example, the complexities of international communism, the formation of a global radicalism of anti-imperial and anti-capitalist orientation, and the position of Eastern Europe in it, as well as the effects of the multiple migrations in the wake of the October Revolution. For and beyond the revolutionary period and into the Cold War, the field of internationalism, as well as of the history of science and knowledge, and here in particular the history of area studies, have turned out to be particularly productive, as well as histories of tourism and consumerism, as well as of youth and women's movements, for example. They have all, all turned out to be particularly productive to recover the richness of cultural transfers across and within the region. Further work has addressed the formation of the bloc or the socialist camp as an effect of transnational encounters and counter transfers, as well as beyond the socialist camp to investigate East-West encounters. In some of the leading international journals in the field, the prominence of such transfer approaches is articulated in different ways. While, for example, Ab Imperio naturally plays, pays close attention to the transnationality of the Russian and Soviet imperial and post-imperial spaces and provides in this respect a unique richness of studies, Kritika has given space not only to studies which investigate trans-imperial interactions and transfers between the Russian Empire and its neighboring empires, most prominently the Ottoman Empire, the journal Critica also draws attention to intra and trans imperial histories of religious communities, including Islam and Orthodox Christianity, shaping networks along which the region became closely connected to non European world regions as well. For the Cold War period, Critica has widely published contributions which expand the geography of cultural transfers, including Soviet Eastern European, Soviet Western, as well as Soviet Global South axis. The German journals Jahrbücher für die Geschichte Osteuropas as well as Osteuropa pay in comparison less attention to questions of cultural transfer inside and beyond the region. Both journals' scope rarely extends beyond the region, with the exception of investigating transfers and connections to Western Europe, but have more recently also produced a few contributions which address, for example, interconnections between Pan-Asianism and the Russian Revolution via the impact of Russian emigres to Japan, or the role of specialists on Eastern Europe as mediators between East and West. These studies, in sum, have contributed to a better understanding of the plurality of cultural transfers within the region, as well as problematizing assumptions about its isolation and immobility in the 20th century. The geographies and directionalities of such transfers have become ever more expanded and nuanced with scholarship addressing East-South connections during the Cold War. There are new routes of investigations now that open up from here uh, that is a combination of such geographies and their decentering. Recently, Rachel Applebaum has pointed to the necessity to intersect the di different geographies of transfers, both within the camp, towards the West and towards the South. This, I argue, can be done in two ways, from a perspective from within the region, as Applebaum does, or from a perspective on the region from its outside, as I would like to suggest here in the last part of my paper. It is at the intersection of histories of mobilities and of cultural transfers that I'd locate my own work, which is situated in the Soviet African geography of encounters during the Cold War, and in which I'm interested in how socialism became a global project, including its ambition for the shaping of a new world order and the framing of socialist modernity. I will now turn to some of the circulations and encounters, as well as transfers that I deal with in the context of my own research. It was not just the formation of the Soviet Union as the first socialist state, or later the globalizing ambition of Soviet elites during the context of the Cold War that transformed socialism into a global project. I will here focus on three 
intellectual and physical mobilities of three intellectuals who are not from the region and not even from Europe namely Walter Rodney, Sil R. James, and Krama Krumann. And I will discuss how their mobilities impacted on their conceptualization of a post-colonial order through the looking glass of the Russian Revolution and Soviet socialism. I situate these actors and with them Eastern Europe in a fragmented and rebellious transatlantic space. And I will try to shed light on conversations about communism and socialism as a way to situate the region in a complex geography of cultural encounters which were based on professional and intellectual mobilities that often counted Soviet visions of world order and at the same time resulted in long lasting legacies of leftist thinking after the Cold War. I want to bring here together three dimensions of intertwined cultural transfers. That is firstly, the mobility of black radical intellectuals and activists. Secondly, the circulation and mobilization of ideas about post-colonial futures and socialist terms among these actors. And thirdly, the imagination of a socialist modernity and of Eastern Europe from the outside, both from West and from the South. This imagination emerged at the often strained intersection of two different political and imaginary geographies. That is the post-revolutionary Soviet Union on the one hand and the transatlantic space of black thought on the other. These became interrelated as the effect of the mobilities of both people and ideas whose geographies and logics, however, were not necessarily congruent. The physical, political and intellectual mobilities of my protagonists were not always equivalent in scope and direction with the mobilities of ideas with which they engaged, and they were often cross-cutting post-colonial and socialist geographies. I found in this regard the notion of mutability stemming from virology and appropriate mobility studies particularly inspiring, namely the question of how people, ideas and objects mutate through mobility and interest shared by cultural transfer studies. The mutability of ideas and actors characterized as socialist appears in my larger research context as a crucial driver for a global history of socialism. Yet it is still in poorly understood ways in which these mutations take place, often not neatly fitting into the understanding of the 20th century through a Cold War lens. Already during the high point of communist internationalism in the 1920s, and even more so during the Cold War, the intellectual and political trajectories of actors outside the Soviet realm made socialism a powerful claim-making device in the struggle against racism and colonialism. The Russian Revolution, the fight against fascism in the 1930s and 40s, and the high hopes connected to socialist mo modernities in the context of decolonization provoked activists across the Atlantic to formulate their own interpretations and agendas on the transformation of the capitalist world order after empire, which were often at odds with Soviet auto orthodoxies while appropriating them and closely related to them in complicated ways. Socialism became a highly mobile concept and was pluralized through the mobilities of actors engaging it, thus often challenging socialism's Eurocentric bias and European origins. Yet the relation between visions of a post-colonial order and socialist terms and the physical mobilities of the radical intellectuals promoting it was not one of congruency, suggesting a simple causal link between their sojourns to the Soviet Union and the way how they began to frame socialist futures. One might even go so far as to argue that at times it was exactly the incongruency of the trajectories with this post-Soviet post-revolutionary space that made the appropriation of this revolutionary moment so productive for the conceptualization of post-colonial orders after the revolution. While C.L.R. James never visited the Soviet Union, Kwame Nkrumah traveled to the first socialist state in his role as head of the first independent African state in a tightening Cold War. And Walter Rodney went as a future historian as part of a study tour in the early 1960s. More generally, all three had encountered the Soviet Union more effectively actually in the anti-imperialist hubs of London, Accra or Dar es Salaam, when they became members of Marxist and Trotskyist circles such as James in London, or got in touch with Soviet exiles and black colleagues who had studied in the Soviet Union, such as Rodney in Dar and James in London, or with Soviet advisors and scholars, such as Nkrumah in Accra. But none the least, also through the books and articles in English written by authors whom they had already um, read against the grain. 
These encounters were based not only on their own voluntary or forced mobilities, but on those people they interacted with and from whom they profited for their writing of analysis of the effects of the Russian Revolution on the reordering of the world after empire. Their own and other sojourns promoted the way in which they came to connect Soviet and African and black trajectories, thus massively contributing to the globalization of the Russian Revolution from the outside. Let me now turn to my first protagonist, to Seal R. James. Born in 1901, the West Indian intellectual's politicization certainly began in his native Trinidad, but his activist engagement with Marxist and Trotskyist thought took off in the UK in the 1930s, both in London and in Lancashire, where he was reunited with his childhood friend George Padmore, who links all three protagonists here. In his British years in anti-imperialist London of the 1930s, James not only published his famous study on the revolution in Saint-Domingue in 1937, but the same year, his first ever Trotsky's history of the Communist International, and only a year later, his history of the Negro Revolt, shortly before he left then to the US in 1938, also on the initiative of the exiled Trotsky, whom he visited in Mexico in 1939. In the US, James and Krumah met at Lincoln University, and James turned out to be particularly helpful for Krumah on his way to London, introducing him to Petmore. The writing of his World Revolution was intertwined with James' activism against the persecution of Trotsky, with the Moscow trials going on during the same year. Together with Padmore, who had broken with the Communist International in 1934, which was more of a turn against Stalin's shaping of Soviet domestic and foreign policy than against ideas of anti-capitalist world revolution, for which Lenin and Trotsky seem to be more appropriate proponents, he began to develop an understanding of the strained relationship between European socialist revolutions and the Pan-African movement. This was a difficult divide that also Nkrumah had to navigate since his years in London when he co-organized with Pat Moore the 1945 Pan-African Congress in Manchester. James' work on the World Revolution profited not only from the richness in the British Library, which also Marx and Lenin had appreciated, as well as publications of the Communist Party in Britain, but he also profited from reports and analysis he received from Padmore, as well as exiled Soviet citizens in London. He had also be, uh, been correspondent with Trotsky when writing his book, but met him personally only after its publication in Trotsky's Mexican Exile. Due to the parallel work on the histories of the Haitian and Russian revolution, James was not only well prepared for drawing global comparisons, but also for reflecting on the multiple scales on which these revolutions unfolded and were connected by considering not only the national, but also the international effects these dramatic events had for global empire and for global capitalism. To James, the leaders of both revolutions had ultimately failed for the same reasons they were not able to make it, make it permanent. Yet the international relevance of the Russian Revolution was to be found for James less in the domestic complexities, but in the establishment of the Third International, which became a crucial infrastructure for anti-colonial movements across the world, thus intertwining the European working class movements with broader attempts to shatter Western and European empires. While the Abyssinian War and the to them disappointing position of the Soviet Union in this conflict had already drawn James, Patmore, and many other black radicals away from the Soviet Union as a vanguard for anti-imperialist revolution. It seems that James' encounter with independent Ghana contributed to him increasingly disentangling black and social Soviet revolutionary movements. James had stayed in the US until he was forced to leave the country in 1953 and returned to London from where he traveled to Ghana in 57 before he resettled to Trinidad in 58 and returned to the US in 68, but spending his last years in the 1980s in London again. Developments in Ghana left him deeply impressed and he began to question the interdependency of Western and African revolutions, arguing that Ghana was on the way to a transition that I quote, neither the USSR nor Eastern Europe were capable of making. However, his enthusiasm dramatically declined during the 1960s. Here again, he was frustrated that the revolution had not been made permanent, but was stuck in the, a corrupted bureaucracy and a distorted state, as he argued. In search for alternative models, 
he turned to Tanzania as a new hopeful candidate for a sincere anti-colonial, anti-capitalist revolution. This interest furthered also his breaking away from the model of modernization most prominent in Eastern Europe socialism with a focus on industrialization. Pre-capitalist forms of communal organization and in particular the role of the peasantry gained for him ever more importance to Africanize a socialist revolution, a focus of interest he shared with Nkrumah and Rodney together with other theorists of African socialism. Let me now shed some light on Kwame Nkrumah. Also Nkrumah had gotten in touch with black nationalist and pan-African ideas during his early education in the Gold Coast, for which Catholic institutions had played a crucial role. Meeting Nandi Azikiba as a lecturer in Amisano, where he worked as a teacher in a Catholic seminar, he followed Azikiba's recommendation to go and study to Link at Lincoln University, Azikiba's alma mater in the US. Arriving in the US in 1935, the events in Ethiopia also fueled his engagement with Pan-African and Black radical thought. Having been made familiar with ideas of Marcus Garvey, this influence increased when he met Garvey in the US, furthering his Pan-African commitment. At Lincoln University, he became acquainted with James in 1943, who recommended him to Petmore in London when Krumer was planning to go in 45. Lodged at the hostel of the West African Student Union, Nkrumah became immediately involved in London's Black radical community and began to work closely with Petmore, a relationship that would further strengthen until Petmore's death in 59. At the Pan-African Congress in Manchester in 45, Nkrumah also met Du Bois again, with whom he had gotten acquainted with already in the US. But the Congress provided a unique historical moment in which most prominently past and future proponents of pan-Africanism of different kinds were drawn closer to each other, furthering African and Black theorizations of anti-colonial revolution and socialist transformation. Nkrumah returned to Ghana in 47. When he became the first president of independent Ghana in 57, Petmore joined him in 59 as one of his closest friends and advisors until 59. And with, while Padma, in his role, dampened a too rapid approachment of Nkrumah to the Soviet Union, Du Bois advised Nkrumah to seek assistance from socialist countries and not, and, uh, not follow a path of reformed capitalism. Hence, Nkrumah had not only to navigate between Eastern European notions of post-colonial futures, but also between different stand, strands of pan-Africanism. As president, Nkrumah started to tour not only the US in search of support for his Pan-African project and Ghanaian independence, but also Eastern Europe, China, and also Vietnam in the 1960s, from where he, by the way, could not return in 66 when, he, when a coup um, against him was launched in, in Ghana. Nkrumah found exile in Conakry, where President Zekuture made him honorary co-president. It was in Bucharest in Romania where he sought medical treatment as his health was failing and where he died of cancer in 72. Into the Cold War, Nkrumah found itself at the center of a partly fierce discussions about the shape of post-colonial futures. He had himself prominently evoked imaginations of links between a Soviet post-colonial condition and African trajectories. Most obviously, this was reflected in the title of a 65 book, Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism, reviving Lenin's famous Imperialism, The Last Stage of, Commun of Capitalism from 1917. Building upon Lenin's analysis of the 19th century financial capitalism, Nkrumah argued that former independence of former colonies had not yet resulted into an end of colonialism, but rather was translated into what he conceptualized as neocolonialism, a term frequently used also by Soviet authors to blame the West's approach to the newly independent states. Nkrumah unmasked numerous practices and institutions which allegedly were designed to provide an equal place to the new African nations in the new global order, such as the conclusion of new economic agreements or the setting up of aid programs by international organizations such as the World Bank as a way to continue practices of Western exploitation and dominance in Africa. He included intelligence services, but also mass media and cultural industries into the neo-colonial repertoire and emphasized that only pan-regional African solidarity would be an effective way to overcome these conditions. 
In a similar vein, evoking the Leninist tradition of anti-capitalist and anti-Western critique, the journal published by the Bureau of African Affairs since 62 as The Spark alluded to the Russian socialist journal Iskra. And Krumer's political vision, however, was of course much more complex than being tied to a socialist or Soviet tradition only, which he rather productively appropriated to make it part of a larger pan-African project. In particular, in conversation with his close friends and advisor George Petmore, Petmore and Krumer's analysis of neocolonialism hampered relations also with Soviet officials in the late 1950s as representatives of white European power. Petmore had been crucial for building anti-colonial non-white alliances in the framework of the Communist International in the 1920s, but had become a prominent castigator of Stalin's assess and his abandonment of black internationalist movements. While the Soviet counterparts in the Cold War failed to understand this context of Nkrumah's early reluctance, but rather interpreted it in a Cold War context, Western observers made the same mistake to misconceive Nkrumah's engagement with Soviet political thought and blamed him to be a communist, ignoring his much more innovative and larger project to rethink African territoriality and African international positionality. Those competing intellectual geographies continue to manifest themselves around the interpretations of what had happened in Krumah's Ghana after his ousting from power. More than 10 years after um, uh, discussions about Nkrumah in the 1960s, Seal R. James published his reflections on Nkrumah and the Ghana revolution in 77, basing this on text he had particularly written almost two decades earlier. James had turned to Nkrumah's project as a promising path to the Africanization of a post-colonial future, but became, as I explained above, increasingly frustrated with the materialization of this vision in Ghana. He articulated this critique through an engagement with the Soviet trajectory out of empire into socialist modernity. In the collection of essays, James presented Nkrumah as the founding father of African emancipation, while at the same time criticizing the degeneration of his regime. His engagement with Krumah and his legacy aimed to reinterpret the geography of his intellectual trajectory by at the same time closely connecting it to Soviet and African post-colonial tracks. James confirmed the importance of Lenin's contribution to Nkrumah's thinking, but combined this with the, in his view, more crucial impact of Petmer, Du Bois and himself on the formation of Nkrumah's political project. In this way, he relocated Nkrumah's intellectual origins to London, the West Indies and the US, rather than identifying them in Moscow. At the same time, James emphasized the similarities between Russia and Ghana as underdeveloped countries, arguing that they had to face comparable challenges on their way out of backwardness and empire. He explained the excesses and degenerations of the political regimes both in Ghana and the Soviet Union as an effect uh, of the backwardness of both societies, as he put it, and the legacies of imperialism. In addition, he introduced Lenin as a thinker who had seen the excesses in the Soviet Union coming from early onwards, just as West Indian intellectuals such as Aimé Césaire uh, had done so when analyzing post-colonial African trajectories. Drawing manifold comparisons between the pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary situations in the Soviet Union and in African states, James used the excesses in the Soviet development as a way to denounce contemporary African trajectories. My final case is here, Walter Rodney. Born in 1942 in British Guyana, Rodney went in 1960 for three years to study at the University of the West Indies at Mona in Jamaica, from where he went on a tour across the Soviet Union um, to study. He relocated from there to London, where he obtained his doctorate in African history with honors at the School of Oriental and African Studies. It was in post-imperial London, where he not only got involved in the still active Marxist and Trotskyist circles of the city, now in the context of the Cold War, but also with James, whose work he much appreciated. It were Rodney's years at the University College of Dar es Salaam, with interruptions between 66 and 74, which was probably the academically and intellectually most productive period in his life, in which some of the most renowned books and articles were written or conceived, in addition to a wide range of political public appearances in various journals of Tanzanian youth and national movement, 
including Cheche, the Tano's Youth League magazine since uh, 1969, uh, Cheche being the Swahili word for the spark, again a reminiscent to Lenin's early activities. In his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, uh, this book belongs unto today to the most uh, influential contributions of black intellectuals to analyze and criticize colonial and post-colonial trajectories. In Dar es Salaam as a hub of decolonization, Rodney also prepared lectures he held in 1970 and 1971 on the Russian Revolution, which he published, which were published in 2018 for the first time in book format as the Re Russian Revolution, a view from the third world. In How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, Rodney had presented socialism, citing the models of the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, North Korea, and Eastern Europe as the only solution to end colonial exploitation of Africa. But in this book, it was less the Russian Revolution which made Rodney optimistic for a socialist-framed anti-colonial revolution, but rather the dynamics in Vietnam, Southern Africa, and the Lusophone colonies. Joining the group of nine after 1967, together with uh, John uh, Saul, Saul Pic uh, Picciotto and Giovanni Arrighi, um, Rodney fiercely advocated for a revision of the syllabus at the university and the reorganization of the university administration more broadly in socialist terms. As a result of these efforts, the Department of Development Studies was established in 1973. Its staff was also composed of Tanzanian scholars who had studied, for example, in Leipzig, Sofia, Prague, or Moscow. Less prominent than how Europe underdeveloped Africa, but particularly illuminating with regard to the intertwinement of post-colonial transformations in Eastern Europe and Af uh, Africa, Rodney's Russian Revolution revealed the unique contribution of Black intellectual intellectuals to globalize socialism. While in How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, the Soviet Union appeared as a model for post-colonial African states, his work on the Russian Revolution differs in this approach. Rodney works here through the Russian Revolution in order to raise the awareness of his students to make their own sense of the dynamics in Africa. Russia and the Soviet Union became here on the one hand a looking glass through which also to discern the dangers and degenerations of anti-colonial revolutions, it was less a call for understanding the model character of the Russian Revolution, but to develop a sincere African position vis-a-vis -vis world history by teaching it from an African perspective to African students, and I quote, to provide our own people with a global perspective. He used his course on the Russian Revolution, which is otherwise very much focused on domestic Russian and Soviet dynamics, to make African subjects in the writing of global history via comparison. I quote, all Europeans compare Shaka to Napoleon, Dahomey to Sparta. The time will probably come when African teachers will make 17th century European feudalism more readily comprehensible to African students by pointing at similarities and contrasts in 14th century Ethiopia. Quote end. Rodney thus not only situated the Russian Revolution in a broader global context, comparing it to African, Cuban, and Chinese trajectories but by distancing it from Western as well as Soviet accounts of the revolution. Still, he claims the understanding of the Soviet Union is a priority that is self-evident, as it was, I quote, the first decisive break away from international capitalism, thereby affecting the subsequent course of events around the world, including Africa, quote end. Starting from this basic assumption, Rodney embarked on an analysis of the Russian revolution in its own right, to make his students come to conclusion themselves in how far they would understand it as a model for Africa. While Rodney systematically compared the Russian Revolution to dynamics in Asia, the Caribbean, and Africa, he does not outrightly present it as a model, rather as a lens through which to understand the African present. One of his major themes in this regard was the agrarian question, which was also a crucial challenge in terms of the respatialization of African societies. In the chapter on Building a socialist state, um, he hence started with the claim, I quote, that one of the most crucial tasks facing the Soviet regime was how to make the agrarian sector socialist. And while he did not ignore the atrocities committed in the context of forced collectivization in the years under Stalin, which he also based on Soviet contemporary accounts of this period, he used the African lens to invite for alternative interpretations. I quote, we who have suffered from the same exploitation and oppression ought to be able to take a more understanding view of why poor peasants wreak personal vengeance on the kulaks and other well-to-do peasants. 
we can take a more compassionate view without necessarily saying that Stalin's policy was right or that the Bolshevik government should be free of flame, blame. Quote end. While James never visited the Soviet Union, Rodney and Krumer had embarked on shorter visits in very different functions and with very different assumptions and goals. These physical relocations of the first socialist states in order to witness the transformations of the revolution, however, need to be contextualized in larger patterns and geographies of their mobilities, which had mobilized them to engage with the revolution and the Soviet Union as relevant examples, models or lenses through which to theorize post-colonial transformations in Africa and black agency in these kinds of revolutions more broadly. Here, it is the combination of voluntary and forced mobilities benefiting from the infrastructures of the old empires, as well as of Cold War competition, which gravitated towards hubs such as London, Accra or Dar es Salaam. In their cases, it was less Moscow, Prague or Tashkent, which became crucial portals in which their visions of a new order were formed. But at the same time, the sojourns to London or Dar es Salaam brought them in contact with otherwise mobile actors who carried with them experiences of sojourns in a European socialist world. Thus, these connections between socialist transformations in Eastern Europe and in Africa were forged not necessarily through physical and stable East-South exchanges, but not less effective through intellectual and political mobilities beyond a narrow, narrowly understood East-South geography. I come to conclusions. I've tried in this paper to shed some, some light on three unique but closely connected protagonists of a radical Atlantic expanding uh, to Eastern Europe and Asia, whose mobilities have impacted on the ways in which they conceptualize a post-colonial spatial order. Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union specifically, was the crucial anchor point to their proposals and through their writings, teachings and activism, they fueled the globalization of the project of a socialist, a Soviet modernity, in parallel as well as in conflict to Soviet projects developed at home. What I've also tried to show is that cultural transfers have emerged in this regard um, also as a product of misunderstandings and ruptures and were shaped by incongruencies of, and, uh, incongruencies of the transfers. Furthermore, I've tried to uh, shed a little bit light on how comparison has been applied by uh, historical actors as a practice in their cultural transfer processes. And finally, what I've tried to show is how cultural transfers have led to the formation of new spaces beyond the nation and beyond the blocks of the Cold War, here with regard to a radical red and black Atlantic. I thereby try to present a proposal how to situate Eastern Europe on a global map of uh, cultural transfers through a lens that goes beyond the West, namely from the East and from the South, but which at the same time integrates Western Europe and the West more broadly, into uh, the story as its specific uh, position can certainly not be neglected. It is therefore that I'm looking very much forward to your comments and the discussion. <laughs>